Every language needs to solve the problem of how to specify who's doing what to whom in any given phrase. In the last video in this series, we discussed how this can be accomplished by marking the verb with affixes that agree with at least one of the arguments in person, number, and or gender. But another equally viable strategy for marking roles is to use case marking, in which nouns are appended with markers that signify the role they play in the phrase, whether it be the subject, direct object, indirect object, or the object of an adposition. Consider how in English, if we take a sentence like, I saw her, and reverse the role of the subject and object, the arguments undergo a change in form to reflect their change in roles. In English, this only happens among pronouns, but in many languages, all nouns exhibit this sort of morphological change. About 60% of languages employ some form of case marking, though there's a lot of scope for variation on how these systems work. Case morphology almost always evolves from adpositions, or sometimes adverbs or demonstratives, that become used to mark the grammatical relationships between the verb and its arguments. Over time, the markers become phonologically dependent on the nouns they modify and become dedicated case affixes. Some languages, like classical Nahuatl and Mohawk, have systems that may superficially seem like case marking, where an adpositions can suffix onto the nouns they modify, but these sorts of systems usually aren't considered case systems in the truest sense, because most of the time the suffix form is optional, and there's no specific marking for core arguments. However, once these adpositions become associated with their dependent nouns to the point that the nouns can't occur without them, they become full-fledged case markers. The number of cases a language may distinguish can vary broadly, from only two or three, like in Persian and Romanian, to over a dozen, like Finnish and Hungarian. However, cross-linguistically, some case distinctions are more commonly made than others. The subject of a phrase will most often be placed in the nominative case, which in most languages will be left unmarked, while the direct object will be placed in the accusative case, which may come from adpositions like to, at, or against. Conversely, in ergative systems, the subject of an intransitive verb and the direct object of a transitive verb will both be placed in the absolutive case, which is also usually left unmarked, while the agent of a transitive verb will be placed in the ergative case, which may evolve from adpositions like by, with, or from. The genitive case is used to mark the noun as the possessor of another noun in the phrase, usually one immediately adjacent to it, and sometimes also marks the noun as the object of certain adpositions. The genitive usually evolves from adpositions like of, related to, with, or from. The dative case marks the indirect object or beneficiary of the verb, and can also sometimes be used to indicate motion towards the noun, and appropriately derives from adpositions like for or toward. The instrumental marks the noun as the means by which the verb is carried out, and may come from an adposition like with or by means of. The instrumental sometimes overlaps with a committative case, which marks accompaniment or association with an adjacent noun. Many languages will use the same morphology to mark the instrumental and committative, and leave it up to context to disambiguate things. Think about how in English, the word with can be used to express either instrumentality or accompaniment. The locative case marks location at, in, or on the noun, and, as you might expect, usually comes from an adposition conveying a similar meaning. And the ablative case marks movement away from the noun, usually coming from an adposition meaning from. Many languages will make use of other, more specific cases, but these are the most common cases cross-linguistically. These cases also form a hierarchy from most common to least common, so if a language has any of the cases on this list, it will usually also have all the cases above it. However, the specific usage of each of these cases, as well as the terminology assigned to it, will vary considerably from language to language, and, quite frequently, any given case will have additional non-canonical uses beyond its default encoding. Often, a single case marker can be used to mark more than one role. For instance, in Manchu, the genitive and instrumental are encoded by the same marker, as are the locative and the dative. The various functions that any given case marker can perform will largely be determined by its lexical source. For example, if a language evolves a genitive case from an adposition that means something like with, then perhaps the genitive carries with it an association of relatedness, so it might also fill the role of a committative case. 
Or perhaps instead, the genitive evolves from an adposition meaning away from, and so may come to also fill the role of an ablative case. When making a case system for a naturalistic conlang, it's worth deciding the lexical source of each of your cases from the very beginning, and letting their implicational meanings inform their usage. Sometimes, the cases assigned to the core arguments of a phrase will vary based on the semantics of the verb. Quirky subject is a phenomenon wherein a subject is marked with a case other than the expected nominative, most often when the subject has low agency or is in some way both agent-like and patient-like. A very common variation of quirky subject is to assign the dative case to the subjects of verbs of experience or sensation, or verbs that encode a change of state. There are even relics of this in English, as in the archaic methinks. In some languages, like Sadri, the case of the subject may also change to reflect the event structure or the tense and aspect properties of the verb. Among ergative languages like Basque and Georgian, the subjects of most intransitive verbs are marked with the absolutive or nominative, as one would expect, but some high-agency intransitive verbs mark their subjects in the ergative. Similar case alternations can occur with a direct object as well. In Finnish, marking the direct object with the accusative case implies a completed or successful action, while using the partitive or genitive cases implies an incomplete or irresultative meaning. Similarly, differential object marking is a phenomenon found in many languages where the semantic properties of any given direct object determine some aspect of its marking, usually related to animacy or definiteness. In Turkish and Amharic, the direct object is only marked with the accusative if it's definite, otherwise the nominative is used, while in Malayalam, the accusative marker only goes on animate nouns. Once again, for your own conlang, think about the etymology of your case suffixes to help extrapolate any additional uses they might have. Beyond the number and usage of cases, another point of variation among case systems is where the case marking occurs. Case markers sometimes exist as a series of distinct particles separate from the noun stem, like in Japanese, Manchu, and Korean, although it's more common for case markers to exist as affixes. However, while these affixes usually occur directly on the noun stem, this isn't the only possibility. In some languages, like Basque, case suffixes only appear on the final word in the noun phrase, whatever part of speech it may be. It's also very common for modifiers, like adjectives, demonstratives, and articles, to take case markers to agree in case with the nouns they modify. One interesting thing to note, however, is that marking case with suffixes is overwhelmingly more common than using prefixes, even in otherwise exclusively prepositional languages. Wherever the case markers occur, they're very likely to become phonologically reduced over time through frequent use. The precise way the case markers get reduced may be influenced by the phonology of the noun stem, and so every noun may follow one of several patterns, or declensions, based on the form of the case markers they take. In old and or heavily fusional systems like Latin, Greek, and Russian, these declensions may be further divided into finer patterns based on gender and number. Once a language has case marking, new adpositions may evolve to replace those that became case markers or to convey more specific meanings than the case markers alone. One very common pathway is for new adpositions to evolve from nouns used in possessive phrases, especially body parts. And since they derive from possessive phrases, they'll frequently assign the genitive case to the nouns they modify. Or, another common possibility is for new adpositions to evolve from verbs, which will therefore assign to the noun whichever case they had previously assigned to their objects. Sometimes, a single adposition will encode different meanings depending on which case the noun it modifies is placed in. In Latin, using the preposition in with the accusative case creates the meaning of motion into the noun, while using the same preposition with the ablative case instead encodes a position at, in, or on the noun. With further evolution, these complementary adpositions may get affixed onto the inflected noun to become a new, compound case marker with a more specific meaning. In Old Lithuanian, an adposition meaning at, or with, became suffix to the locative and genitive to create the adhesive and allative cases respectively. As well as gaining new cases, languages can lose cases over time as well often due to phonological changes that result in multiple case markers having identical phonological forms. 
at one point, Latin had a separate locative case to encode position and location, but over time, sound changes resulted in it becoming identical to the genitive and dative in most declensions, and so the locative was almost completely lost in classical Latin outside of a small set of common words. And the locative's meaning was replaced by the ablative case in conjunction with the preposition in. If enough of these sorts of changes take place, it's even possible that the entire case system can be leveled, with new constructions evolving to convey the meanings of the lost case markers, as happened in both the Romance languages and in English. If a language does lose its case marking, it will need to rely on some other mechanism to mark roles, which in the case of English and the Romance languages, took the form of a shift to a stricter word order, supplemented by the verb agreement retained from the older languages. Remember, it's comparatively rare for a language to rely on just one of these role marking strategies, so when creating a case system for a conlang, think about what other role marking systems might be used to reinforce meanings. So in summary, if you're looking to create a naturalistic case system for a conlang, decide what roles the system is going to mark and where the marking is going to occur, evolve case markers by affixing add positions or other modifiers to noun stems, Decide what other meanings each case marker might be used to convey based on its lexical source, and determine how the cases interact with any other role marking strategies the language might have. Overall, case marking is a relatively easy way to clear up any ambiguity surrounding grammatical roles, and presents the opportunity for a lot of fun and interesting constructions if you play around with it.